Hello, and welcome to the Drug Discovery World podcast. My name is Giles, and I'm here to take you through another topical and insightful article from Drug Discovery World. Welcome to another bonus webinar episode of the Drug Discovery World podcast. Today's episode is taken from one of our DDW webinars, titled The Kinetics of Drug Receptor Binding. Why is it important, and how can we measure it? This podcast version has been adapted from the webinar audio, so apologies if the sound quality isn't the usual standard. If you prefer, the link to the original webinar recording, including graphs and illustrations, is in the show notes. Before I begin the main episode, I want to briefly announce that registration is now open for a new upcoming Drug Discovery World webinar. This will be taking place on the 25th of September 2018. The webinar is on the topic of Multiplexing Specificity and Species Cross-Reactivity Assays in Biologics Discovery. Registration for the webinar is free, and you can find out more details and a link to register in the show notes. So now, on to the main episode. Uh, Welcome everybody to this Drug Discovery World webinar entitled The Kinetics of Drug Receptor Binding. Why is it important and how can we measure it? It is increasingly appreciated that the rate at which drugs associate and disassociate from receptors directly impact drug efficacy and safety. However, the molecular determinants of drug receptor binding kinetics remain poorly understood and are are rarely measured early in the drug discovery process. Today, we are delighted to have a panel of three experts from this field who will review current methods for measuring uh, receptor kinetics and then describe some novel new approaches. So let's meet them. Firstly, we have Dr. Stephen Charlton, who is currently Professor of Molecular Pharmacology and Drug Discovery at the University of Nottingham. He is followed by Dr. Louise Affleck, who is Business Development Manager for Life Sciences uh, at CIS Bio Bioassays. And then she is followed by Catherine Walk, who is a Senior Application Scientist with BMG LabTech. I'm Robert Jordan, Publisher and Editor-in-Chief of Drug Discovery World, DDW, and I'm going to serve as your moderator today. So I think we're now ready to go. Um, So if you're sitting comfortably at your screens, let's get started. Our first speaker is, as I say, Dr. Stephen Charlton. So if you're ready, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robert, for that introduction. In this first talk, what I'd like to do is introduce the concept of the kinetics of drug binding and ask really the question of why it might be important, not only in terms of achieving better clinical efficacy, but also to better understand and interpret in vitro assay data. But before I launch into a discussion around kinetics, I want to introduce uh, the team that's been working on this at Nottingham. The Molecular Pharmacology and Drug Discovery team moved to Nottingham about 18 months ago. We were previously working at Novartis Respiratory Group in Horsham. Um, And when that closed down, we decided to move to Nottingham to join the already well-established cell signaling research group of Steve Hill. Because we've come from a drug discovery background, we have two main interests. Our key academic interest um, for a long time has been working in the area of kinetics, understanding not only the basis of kinetics of ligand binding, but also how that might affect signaling observed in cells. But we also have an interest in drug discovery, initiating our own projects, also working in collaboration to do collaborative projects or to support um, other people's internal projects in terms of assay development and detailed mechanism of action studies. So the first thing I'd like to do is really introduce binding kinetics and the simplest reaction scheme of a ligand with receptor. And we have binding according to the law of mass action. The rate of that uh, ligand and receptor binding is driven by uh, an association rate constant. And that has units both of time, but also of concentration, because the association rate is concentration dependent. The dissociation rate of the ligand from receptor is is defined by the dissociation rate, and that is only governed by time. Now, the ratio of the dissociation rate over the association rate defines the affinity at equilibrium, or the equilibrium dissociation constant. We often use this um, measure as our measure of affinity simply because the kinetics of binding are difficult to measure compared to saturation at equilibrium. In terms of the association um, of a drug to a receptor, 
it proceeds over time and to a point where it reaches a plateau. Now, that plateau um, is the point it reaches equilibrium. That doesn't mean that the system is now static and that all ligands are bound to receptor. What that means is that the rate of association of ligand and receptor is equal to the rate of dissociation. So the system is still very dynamic. We have binding and unbinding events at that point, um, but we have no net gain in ligand receptor complexes. In terms of measuring kinetics, I just wanted to introduce why we might be interested in it um, in terms of at least clinical benefit. Now, perhaps the best understood, best well-known um, benefit is in terms of enhancing duration of action in the clinic. Certainly for receptors, I suppose the biggest uh, example of this for some time has been in the inhaled muscarinic receptor antagonist field for the treatment of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. There are two molecules here, both from Boehringer and Gorheim. Uh, the first generation, ipratropium, needs to be dosed four times a day, but the second generation, teotropium, only requires once daily dosing. Now, although the pharmacokinetics are not identical, there it was difficult for the, the team at Boehringer to, to really define why this was until they radiolabeled those materials and discovered that the dissociation rate from the M3 receptor, which is the target for these molecules, is much, much slower for teotropium than ipratropium. And indeed, that could contribute a large component to the once daily duration of action. And since then, I've been working with a colleague in Brussels, Georges Vucalan, and we've done a series of simulations really looking at the impact of kinetics on duration of action. And, and certainly, you can um, extend the duration of action with a slow off rate beyond the point where the pharmacokinetics means the ligand has essentially disappeared from the system. But the key point is here that this only really has an effect if the residency time outlasts the drug exposure in terms of pharmacokinetics. So if you have a very long pharmacokinetic profile, then off-rate plays um, no part really in the duration of action there, and that needs to be considered. So that's well established, um, but something that's probably um, less well known is the potential benefit for enhanced efficacy. Now, competitive drugs in an equilibrium situation will cause rightward shifts of concentration response curves to agonists with no reduction in the maximal effect in a shield type analysis. So this type of effect is surmountable and it essentially means that if you put enough agonist into that system, you will always be able to outcompete the antagonist. But if we go back to that point where we have non-equilibrium conditions, then this relationship falls down and the compounds can appear to be irreversible or non-competitive. And this is termed insurmountable. An example of this is for calcium signaling at the M3 receptor. Now here we have um, a concentration response curve to methacholine, and we have that curve in the presence of 10 times Ki concentration of a variety of muscarinic receptor antagonists. But all those antagonists shift the curve to the right, but they also cause a reduction in the maximal effect achievable by methacholine. And the degree of reduction there is directly related to the off rate of those compounds. Now the reason this happens, particularly in, in the calcium assay, is that it's a very rapid signaling system. And so between agonist addition and our measurement of our peak calcium response is often between, just between two to 10 seconds. Now in that time frame, if we have a slowly dissociating compound, it hasn't re-equilibrated enough to be fully um, outcompeted by the agonist. And so a number of those receptors remain blocked, even in the presence of a large concentration of agonist. And this is why we see this insurmountable behavior. Now, this can have important consequences in vivo as well. So if we look at an in vivo experiment now, um, looking at rat bronchoconstriction, we've induced the bronchoconstriction using an IV dose of methacholine, and on the y-axis, we're measuring the uh, lung resistance. As we increase methacholine, we increase lung resistance due to bronchoconstriction. But as we add our drug, this is given directly to the lung, not only do we shift that methacholine curve to the right, but we limit the maximal effect achievable. So even in a fully in vivo situation, we can see insurmountable antagonism. And this can have consequences not only for neuromuscular um, signaling, but also neurotransmission in the, the brain, anything that has a very rapid signaling profile. There's also good examples out there that in other systems, for example, um, the CCR5 receptor antagonists to treat HIV infection. And Pfizer had a very nice um, series of data showing that antiviral efficacy correlated very well with dissociation rate of those compounds. So off-rate appears to potentially give us improved efficacy, but it can also have a downside. And a good example of this is in the dopamine D2 receptor antagonists used as antipsychotics for the treatment of schizophrenia. Now, the original typical antipsychotics have very slow dissociation, 
they cause quite significant extrapyramidal side effects. These are Parkinson-type um, side effects through blockade of signaling in the nigrostriatal pathway. The newer atypical antipsychotics, um, like clozapine, don't have such an issue here. And it's hypothesized that these compounds have a more rapid dissociation. And because they're more rapidly dissociating, they display surmountable antagonism and therefore allow a small amount of signaling to occur, so don't completely block that system, therefore cause less side effects. So it could be that in some systems you might want to um, optimize rapid dissociation kinetics as well to avoid on-target side effects. But clinical benefits are not the only reason we need to understand kinetics. We need to understand the kinetics when we're actually characterizing compounds in terms of their pharmacological properties. Now, it's long been understood that if you don't leave an experiment, a binding assay, to equilibrate for long enough, you can either underestimate or overestimate the affinity of a compound depending on their rate of equilibration relative to the radio ligand. Something I really wanted to introduce, which is perhaps less well understood, is the impact on functional assays. Now, with functional assays for receptors, we have a number of different options to look at signaling. These range from very rapid signaling assays, for example, confirmation or change by um, FRET biosensors that happen in the millisecond range, all the way up through calcium and cyclic AMP to very long readouts, either reporter gene assays or um, late stage um, phenotypic readouts like proliferation of cells. Now, the key element here is that depending on where on in that time frame we measure our response, can define where we are on our equilibration time point for our agonist. So a very rapid time point may mean that not all of our agonists has had time to bound to a receptor. So we may not have full occupancy. Whereas if we leave our system for much longer, we should achieve full equilibrium. And we've been exploring this functionally for a number of agonists that have slow dissociation rates. The first example is a compound called C26 developed in Novartis. This is a very slowly dissociating beta-2 adrenal receptor agonist. And then we have three different signaling readouts, cyclic AMP, arrest and recruitment, internalization. For each of those different signaling systems, C26 has a slower signaling profile in the early time points than either isoprenaline or adrenaline. But at later stages, it actually appears to be higher efficacy. Now, depending on when we take a reading from, if we didn't, for example, do full kinetic reads, if we looked at the reading at an early time point, you would call C26 a partial agonist compared to adrenaline. If you left the system longer, you might call that agonist a superagonist. So the time point at which you measure these compounds can actually really define how you define the efficacy of those compounds. Another example um, was with a collaboration that has just been published um, with Monash University, where we were looking at um, a series of D2 receptor agonists. And they had a, um, a series of lovely data looking at uh, many different signaling pathways across different time points. And we identified that there's a compound by Frepronox, um, which has very slow association kinetics. And you can see that while rapinarol uh, actually gets less active with time, presumably through desensitization of that response, by Frepronox actually increases its potency with time. So it behaves very differently. So if kinetics are very important, how do we measure them? Now, kinetics traditionally has really only been measured using radiolabel material, which tends to only be available during um, late stage drug discovery where you have one or two selected compounds. And there the kinetics can be investigated using standard filtration type assays or SPA assays. But although you can characterize your clinical compound, it doesn't give you any information on allowing you to develop the kinetics per se as part of the optimization process. The advent I and mean, the introduction of surface plasma resonance techniques has really revolutionized our ability to look at more compounds, particularly for um, soluble proteins such as enzymes. There's still some issues in utilizing this with uh, membrane proteins, and some compound classes also have issues in terms of, of interacting with the chip. But certainly we can look at hundreds of compounds using this, um, and I do know some groups who, who actually run thousands of compounds through these systems, although it takes a huge amount of effort and multiple machines to do that. But what we were really looking for is a method that would fit in to this HIT validation phase where we could look at thousands of compounds in kinetic mode. What we wanted to achieve during this assay development was achieve a 3 8 well compatible system. Um, we wanted our receptors to be in our native lip lipid environment, ideally in a membrane, and certainly if we were able to look at in whole cells would be perfect. 
We wanted a system that was able to um, have a continuous read uh, detection, so we were able to look at kinetics in a single well. And it was important to us that we had an injector system because we needed to look at time points very early on after compound addition. And finally, we've done a lot of work previously looking at the influence of temperature on kinetics, so having full temperature control was also important. So really, with all those in mind, um, what we did is we, we looked at a variety of different systems out there, and we settled on testing the SysBio Taglite assay system in conjunction with the BMG Ferrostar, which in our minds fits these requirements. So what I'm going to do now is, is stop there, and I'll, I'll hand over to Louise and, and then Catherine to talk through these systems, and then afterwards I'll come back and, and talk about our um, assay optimization phases. Thank you, Stephen, for that fantastic introduction into the Taglite receptor ligand binding system. Taglite is a fluorescent cell-based assay format, enabling ligand binding kinetics and ligand binding affinity determinations whereby a G-protein receptor is expressed at the cell surface and a SNAP tag is expressed at the end terminal of the receptor. The terbium is then covalently labelled to the SNAP tag. The ligand to the receptor is then labelled with the acceptor. When the labelled ligand comes in close proximity to the donor molecule, the terbium, a threat event is generated. Unlabeled Ligands, unlabeled test compounds can then compete off any labeled acceptor present, thereby preventing a threat. Taglite is easy to use, where the labeled cells are plated out and then the unlabeled compound of interest is added, followed by the labeled fluorescent ligand. As mentioned earlier, it's a competition event, so you measure a decrease in the threat signal in the presence of unlabeled compound. The BMG FX reader is an ideal reader to detect the HTRF threat signal. And Catherine Walk will later describe this in much more detail. So to wrap up, the Taglite system enables ligand binding kinetics due to the no-wash homogeneous assay format. It is a non-radioactive, fluorescent and robust signal is generated. I will now pass on to Catherine Walk at BMG LabTech to describe the Ferrostar FSX in greater detail. So thank you very much, Louise. My name is Catherine Walk and I'm an Applications Manager with BMG LabTech UK. I will be talking today about the Ferrostar FS instrument used by Stephen in his research to date. I'll be covering the standard features of the instrument, but paying particular focus to those that benefit the kinetic tag light approach. I will also take an opportunity today, though, to also introduce our latest product innovation, the Ferrostar FSX instrument. The Ferrostar FSX, for those interested in the kinetic tag light approach, will offer also advantages over the Ferrostar FS system, so it's worth noting um, in this presentation. The Ferrostar FS was introduced in 2009 and is now a very well-established solution for medium to high throughput screening, with its design features made to accomplish both high sensitivity and speed for all plate formats up to 3456. Key to the success of this instrument has been the use of dedicated read technologies for all read modes. With high energy xenon lamp used for optimal fluorescence excitation, a dedicated channel for luminescence, an ultra-fast spectrometer for absorbance, and of course, laser options for both alpha technology and most importantly for this talk, a TRF laser for HGRF. The system also includes a standard simultaneous dual emission for all read modes, fluorescence, and in particular TRFRET, as is relevant to our talk today. So, the Ferrostar FS as is an easy to use system and utilizes an optic module concept. These barcoded modules contain all components needed for an assay, as with the HGRF module that would be used by Stevens' team. All filters, dichroic mirrors are fitted inside to avoid error in installation and to protect these components. Important for HDRF is our use of dedicated redshifted photomultiplier tubes, as these are photon counting detectors and they offer the best sensitivity in this application. And important finally to the tag light approach, as Stevens previously mentioned, would be the injection and incubation system also available for the Ferrostar FS. Other standard features that benefit FS users in and around this GPCR area are obviously top and bottom reading capability, 
This is controlled within the software, making it possible to read even the cell-based tagline assay either from top or bottom with no user changes. Bottom read may be employed where using monolayers of cells. The advanced Z-height detection possible from both top and bottom is not a general feature offered by most HGS units, but it does ensure the best performance um, in reading in either orientation. Finally, to make this system more ultimately suitable as a screening tool, the instrument includes plate barcode readers capable of reading west, south, and east, and also has a stacker option with a continuous loading feature. So now I come to technologies that have a, maybe additional impact or can help with setting up the kinetic tag light assay. I've already mentioned the injectors and incubation setup. I can focus a little bit more on the injectors shortly, but we also have high resolution wild scanning and also that's useful for looking at receptor expression level and also the K curve monitoring curve. This is useful if perhaps optimizing timings or looking to improve assay sensitivity. So now I come on to the specifics for HTRF. We offer two light source options for exciting HTRF, a Xenon flash lamp and a TRF FRET laser. The flash lamp and laser both perform well with great Z primes for both European and terbium donors, but the laser that is optimized at 337 nanometers has a, a little bit of an advantage with terbium based donors creating up to 30, 35% increase in signal window as seen by the data. More importantly for the tag light application, the more energy supplied with each flash of the laser as compared to the flash lamp makes it suitable for reducing flash numbers, decreasing read times for both 384 and 1536 to achieve the fastest read times. We have real flexibility with our injectors. Users can add changeable volumes from well to well, and add volumes as little as one microliter changeable in 0.5 microliter increments. Speed of addition can be regulated by the user to prevent cellular damage, damage to the cell layer. And the most important point is that with the injector system sitting up directly above the well, we can inject and read simultaneously to ensure that we get the fastest dispense and read times over the plate, which is important when trying to sample at a high kinetic rate. So I mentioned I would come on to talk about the Ferristar FSX system. We have built on the success of the Ferristar FS with this platform and have looked to re-engineer all of the optical components to gain sensitivity advantages in all of the major read modes. We also have faster read times for TR FRET with a new faster laser, border dynamic range and luminescence, and have introduced for alpha technology enhanced performance and also simultaneous dual emission for, for alphaplex. For time-resolved fluorescence performance, I've previously mentioned that we've introduced a new faster laser system. The increase in laser speed would make it possible for Steeman to accomplish two possible outcomes. His team could continue to use existing fast capture speeds, but increase the flash number by 50%, which would result in higher signal counts, or they could continue to read with the same number of laser flashes and expect to see an improved plate read time by up to 33%. So I would like to finish off with a brief summary. Both the FS and FSX instruments are perfect to handle this rapid uh, read kinetic HRF application. The laser and injectors are both important factors for the accurate determination of on and off rates. And the new Ferristar FSX, uh, whilst offering general HRF assay performance improvements with its flash lamp, also with the addition of the TRF laser, will give further benefits to the tag light application with respect to speed of reading or higher counts where as needed. Finally then, just to acknowledge our team in Germany and also the CISBO team that have been helpful in preparing this data. We hope that you will put us to the test as Stephen has. And at this stage, I pass over to Stephen. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. I'm going to um, finish now by talking about an assay development utilizing both CISBio and Ferristar to get a kinetic association assay using uh, HTRF. So, Really to refresh what our requirements were, again, I've talked this through already, but we, we really wanted something that had a continuous read in a 384 well format. The systems, as I said before, were utilizing our tag light and Ferristar. 
What I want to highlight is that we utilize the beta-2 adrenoceptor as our model system, and the tracer ligand that we have is a fluorescently labeled propranolol. Now, the first thing that we needed to achieve is the fastest read time possible. Now, the reason we need this speed is because the way we're formatting this assay is to add our reagent into a well and take a read immediately then. Then what we do is move to the second well, add our reagent and read. And we need to do that to as many wells as possible before we then go back to the first well again and take the second read on that first well and then move back over that line. So we're rereading um, a number of wells at any one time. Now the faster we can read each one of those wells defines either the number of wells we can read in one, one plate or the time difference between each reading for each well. So for very rapidly equilibrating compounds, we might need very short time reads to enable to fully fit our kinetics accurately. So the first thing we wanted to do is understand how we were going to excite our donor. And we had two options with the Ferristar, either laser or lamp excitation. Now you can see immediately that the laser is higher power, higher emission, and we get a much higher signal with far fewer flashes. If you ratio those numbers, they come out very similar, as you would expect. But what we wanted to do is really compare whether this higher overall window would give us better reproducibility and less error around um, repeated measurements. So what we did is we took 52 wells, all identical wells, in the center of a 384 well plate, and we read them in succession using a different number of excitation flashes. And we were aiming below 10%. Now you can see that with our initial amount of flashes, up to say 10 or 30 flashes, we started to get close to our target of 10%. But with that number of flashes, it was taking us really 30 seconds to read those 52 wells. When we moved to the laser, already, even just a single flash, we were getting less than 10% variation across those 52 wells. And if we used three laser flashes, we were improving that still. Now, the benefit of using the laser is that we can get across those 52 wells in just four seconds using a single flash in scanning mode. And so we felt that the laser gave us an opportunity to get much more rapid reads. And so we, we utilized the laser from, from this point onwards, either in a single flash or with three flashes. The next thing we um, really needed to do is to characterize our tracer ligand, our fluorescent propranolol. We've added the ligand and watched it associate over time. Um, and then at about 25 minutes, we've added our, a large concentration of competing compound and we can see the dissociation phase. All of those data were generated from a single well. The second looks at the association of different concentrations of propranolol. And this shows that the association rate is concentration dependent. And we can globally fit those data to a, um, a model of association to generate K-on and K-off. But again, we only have four wells from a 384 well plate generating all those data. But what we really wanted to do is to really measure the kinetics of unlabeled compounds. And to do that, we employ a competition association assay format. Now, this was first really described, at least in theoretical terms, by Matoski and Mayhem in 1984. Um, and it involves addition of both the tracer and unlabeled test compound to the receptor preparation at the same time. And then the association of the tracer is monitored and the association rate of the tracer will change in the presence of an unlabeled competitor. What we're able to do then is um, use this mathematical model that they described to fix a variety of parameters that we've already fixed in our experiment. For example, concentration of ligands. We know our association and dissociation rate of our tracer. And if we fix all of that, we can then globally fit our association rate and dissociation rate for our unlabeled compound. But for the HTRF, the first experiment we did um, in this competition mode, the data that we achieve um, by fitting that is um, fairly similar to that that we achieved using our standard radio label assay. Now, something I want to draw your attention to here is the um, difference in throughput. So our radio label experiment, we had three competitor concentrations, and that took a whole 96 well plate to generate those data. With the HTRF tag light system, we used twice as many competitor concentrations, and it took us just seven wells of a 384 well plate. So you can see um, a large improvement in throughput there, and also in reagent saving. We ran in our test case a variety of different beta adrenoceptor ligands, and here we're comparing the on rate and the off rate measured from the HTRF versus our standard radio ligand assay, and there's a fairly good um, agreement there across those two systems.
But again, though, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that each end for the above exper experiments required 25 wells um, using the tag light system, 768 wells using our standard radio ligand binding assay. So we're able to generate those data in a much more rapid manner. A question we asked ourselves really was how many concentrations of competing ligand did we need to get accurate um, estimates of our on and off rate? And I'm showing the same data here for salbutamol. Each point with it, each one of those curves reaches equilibrium, which is the plateau point. We can generate from those data an IC50 curve. Now what we did is we globally fitted all those data, and then we just globally fitted the control curve, but just the single concentration of salbutamol, which is the lowest concentration we tested. There was less than 20% inhibition on our IC50 curve at this point. But when we used that single concentration alone, the fit that we got was not dissimilar, and certainly in terms of the equilibrium constant, the PKD that we estimate there, was similar to that achieved by using the whole concentration range. And this is perhaps our first signal that, that we might not need to run a large number of concentrations, and we might be able to generate on rate, off rate, and equilibrium dissociation constant values from single competitor concentrations. So that was really our, um, our first foray into this system. That was our, our test case. We then went on to really apply it to something that we were really interested in. And this goes back to our question around the D2 dopamine receptor field. Now I've explained to you our interest in this, in that the typical antipsychotics uh, appear to have slower dissociation. The atypicals with lower side effects have a faster dissociation. But the studies from which these um, conclusions were drawn range across several decades, several different labs using different technologies, different assay conditions. It's very difficult to compare all those data in one, in, in one go. So what we wanted to do is utilize this high throughput system to look at a large number of clinically used antipsychotics to measure their dissociation rate and association rate and to see if this hypothesis holds true. Now, when we were generating this D2 receptor assay, we utilized SNAP-tagged D2L receptors expressed in CHO cells, and those were generated by Nick Holliday at the University of Nottingham. The tracer ligand we used was a fluorescently labeled PPHT, which is a partial agonist of the D2 receptor, and that was provided by Thomas Rue at Cispire. And throughout these experiments, we used three laser flashes on the ferrostar. Now, the first thing we did is characterize our tracer, PPHT, and I really wanted to show you here the nonspecific binding levels are very low using, using this system, even at relatively high concentrations of ligand. So if we move on now to the experiments we did in the presence of unlabeled antipsychotic compounds, we have the IC50 curves generated from the equilibrium point of each of these experiments, and then we have three examples of compounds that show different types of kinetic parameters and, and different profiles in this system. And from this, we were able to generate the on and off rates for these compounds and really correlate them with the affinity constant, but also to look at whether or not they were related in terms of their side effect profiles. So for the, the on rate and the off rate, an interesting observation is that for the atypical uh, antipsychotics, the on rate appears to be quite well correlated to their affinity. But for the, the typicals, that's not the case. For the typicals, it's the off rate that appears to be driving their affinity. So that's an interesting potential distinguishing feature. But the real question as to whether or not the typical compounds have a slower off rate and therefore generate a more profound blockade of that system and therefore generate extra pyramidal side effects, when we looked at that question, we found that although some of those typical compounds had very slow dissociation rates, there was a significant overlap with the atypical. So there are a large number of typical compounds in there that show side effects, but which have off rates that are very similar to the typical compounds, which don't show so many side effects. So although we have some support for this kinetic hypothesis, we've also identified that it can't be the whole story and that there's probably other contributing factors in this. We've since done a much more full study and correlated these with clinical readouts as well. And we have a paper that's submitted, which hopefully will be through the review process soon and available for, for download. So I just wanted to, before finishing, just go back to this question of enhanced sensitivity compared to IC50 assays. So we use the same type of analysis for the beta-2 adrenal receptor with this dopamine D2 receptor system. And here is an example from Rupinerol. So we have our different concentrations of Rupinerol. And again, each one of those curves is generated from a single well. We fitted all of those together 
in all six concentrations are globally fitting. And then we've just compared that to the single concentration that gave us the lowest inhibition, so less than 25% inhibition of our tracer binding. When we compare the equilibrium dissociation constant estimates from both of those, whether we use all of the concentrations in that fit or just the one that causes um, less than 25% inhibition, there's a very good correlation of our affinity estimates. Now, what this means, firstly, is that we are able to um, predict affinity constants and on and off rates from fewer numbers of competitor concentrations than you need to generate a whole IC50 curve. But importantly, by fitting this whole kinetic curve at once, we can generate data for compounds that cause almost no inhibition at the equilibrium. So this allows us to look at much lower activity compounds and potentially opens up this system for looking at low affinity fragment screening for GPCRs. And this is certainly something that we're following up on now with a couple of test cases. So to revisit my initial question, what we were, what we were aiming to do, I believe that we have um, established now higher throughput assays for receptors that allow us to look at the, the kinetics of unlabeled compounds, successfully using the tag light combined with the Ferristar to generate this system where we can get kinetics from a single well, 384 well plate. I think that really this now supersedes our need to do full IC50 curves and indeed we get more information, we get the kinetic information out of this as well as our affinity constants. So I think this could essentially replace generating IC50 curves during the HIT validation phase. So to conclude, I hope during the first presentation that I gave examples of why I think kinetics can be an important element to look at in, in drug efficacy and safety, and really that slow off rate is not always better, and that the type of kinetics that you try to optimize will be very dependent on the physiological system that you'd like to modulate. And then the second presentation, shown that we've managed to establish higher throughput kinetic FRET assays, which allows the assessment of kinetics at a much earlier phase, um, in a high throughput mode. They're more sensitive and efficient than IC50 assays. And again, just to say that I really believe that this will open up our ability to do fragment screening in kinetic mode on GPCRs. I wanted to say with the paper there, this is the first paper that's been published by us using this, this method uh, in Nature Communications. And this is the study I talked to you about previously in collaboration with the Monash team, um, with Rob Lane and Arthur Christopoulos. And we have uh, several more on the way. So finally, I just wanted to end by acknowledging the people who did this. The person I need to acknowledge most is David Sykes. He's done a large amount of the work on the CISBio Taglight system and indeed has been working with me for many years on these um, Competition Association Kinetics assays. There are other people at Nottingham who have assisted here. Obviously, the collaboration with Monash University has been excellent with that Nature Communications paper. George Rufkalan has helped um, do a lot of simulations and modeling over the years. And of course, the teams at both BMG Lab, LabTech um, and CISBio for their assistance um, and support while we generate these assays. So that's the end of the, the assay development phase. I'd now like to hand over to Robert, who will open this up for questions. Well, thank you, Stephen. And uh, thank you to all of our uh, contributors. I think they're all very valuable in their own right. OK, we now have actually plenty of questions. And uh, I think the first one uh, we are going to ask is from Benoit Fouchac. I hope I pronounced that properly, from Eurofins uh, Pharma Discovery. Uh, and he's asking, um, and probably this is to you, Stephen, what is the influence of the tracer's affinity on the kinetics and what is maximum ratio of affinities, i.e. Uh, tracer versus competitor, that is acceptable? Right, okay, thank you very much. So um, I think that this was one of several questions I'm asking a, a similar comparison between the kinetics of the tracer and competitor. The kinetics of the tracer certainly affects the accuracy of your kinetic estimates that you get from this type of analysis. We find that if you have a very slowly dissociating tracer, then accurately ascribing kinetics for very rapid competitors is, is very difficult, and there is a point by which you cannot distinguish from the kinetics anymore. So we've actually spent some time trialing different tracers to look at their kinetics versus compounds with different affinity. Um, we're actually at the moment in the process of finishing a paper describing this using both simulation data and also experimental data that we've used around the um, dopamine D2 system. 
So that will be out there. I don't think it's as simple as to give a, a simple ratio of affinities right now, but I think that certainly if you look at some of the simulations that will, will be in that paper soon, then that will give a, an indication of the type of ranges that we'll be looking at. Good. Thank you, Stephen. This one is from Ying Kai Wang from uh, Bristol Myers Squibb BMS, probably directed towards you, Kath. How does the Ferrostar reader compare with Perkin Elmer's Envision or Viewlux? I won't take too much time away from the technical questions. The Ferrostar FS and FSX have probably some of the best specifications for drug discovery with respect to all read modes. Uh, so the time results fluorescence uh, TR FRET application that Stephen's talking about here. The fact that we use um, photon counting devices means that we can get down to very low levels of signal. That in combination with the TRS laser means we can get a fantastically high signal in a short space of time. So in comparison to the Envision that uses a standard integrated photomultiplier tube or the Vulex system, we should be able to see hits that perhaps those systems wouldn't be able to see. And we certainly, for this application, should be able to achieve very high signal in a very rapid read time. Excellent. So this one, Michael Bradley, Cyrus Pharmaceuticals. Probably, this might even be you, Louise, I'm not sure. What acceptor fluorophore was appropriate for use with the TB-labeled SNAP-tagged protein? Um, it's really dependent on the GPCR in question. For some GPCRs, we found that the red accept has been better, and for other GPCRs, we found that the green accept has been better. So if you look on if you look on our website, you'll find the list of ligands that we've already labelled and we've already optimised as well, so whether they're red or whether they're green. Excellent. All right. Uh, we've had a few, well, some questions, some statements. This one's from uh, Professor David Calcoon, uh, I think I pronounced that correctly, from UCL, uh, who's uh, saying that the association rate constants you get seem surprisingly low. Um, usually we get 10.7 or 10.8 per second, not far from diffusion limit. Obviously one for you there, Stephen. Yes, um, yeah, and thanks to, to David for, for the series of questions. Um, very technical, and, and um, I should, should point out actually that David is uh, one of the really early pioneers in looking at kinetics and certainly competition uh, kinetics. So I think the, the examples I gave did have slow association rate constants. We do see for agonists that they tend to be slower than antagonists. When we look at antagonists, we do see rates um, in the range that, um, that David stated there. But I think this really could speak to another concern that, that, that David raised in, in, in another one of his questions about the use of this simple um, single site um, analysis to look at agonists. Now, the thing that agonists do is they can change the conformation of, of the receptor. So you potentially have multiple sites that you're looking at. We try to limit that as much as possible by inc including high concentrations of guanine nucleotide to, to drive at least away the G protein dependent stabilization of a high affinity state. But there's no doubt that even in the absence of an effector, there is probably some isomerization step happening here. So I think um, we need to be very aware that the, the kinetics we're measuring here are a global rate constant. There's probably a number of microscopic uh, rate constants um, in, embedded in that that we can't detect at the moment for GPCRs. Um, although certainly for ion channels and a lot of David's work, you can start to drill down into some of those more um, specific rate constants for each isomerization step. But certainly for receptors right now, we, we have trouble um, teasing those apart. So I think we need to be fairly pragmatic when we look at these numbers. I think there are two components controlling the association rate here. One for agonists is potentially this isomerization step that, that might be occurring. The second, I think, is something that I'm quite interested in, and that's that the association rate um, is largely driven, well, it's, it's driven also, the, at least the estimation of the association rate, by the concentration of of drug that you have in the system. Now we assume that the concentration of drug that the receptor sees is identical to that that's added into the well, into bulk aqueous phase. But some work we've been doing recently um, using fluorescently labeled compounds and fluorescence correlation spectroscopy methods has shown that the concentration um, actually close to the receptor itself within the membrane region or just above the membrane can be very different to that in bulk aqueous. 
So I believe that when we're measuring these rate constants, there is a component of non-specific local concentration of compound that's largely driven by the physicochemical properties of that compound. So I think we need to be careful when we're interpreting um, association rate constants. So that was a very good question, and um, I think that what it shows is that, that certainly for GPCRs, we're not there yet, and uh, we've got a little, a little way to go before we can fully tease out all these microscopic constants. Good. All right. Um, question from David Green at Vertex. Uh, are there any issues around the overexpression of tag light receptors relative to endogenous receptor levels? In other words, are you going to see inverse agonist type effects due to overexpression of receptors affecting the stoichiometry with coupling proteins and GPCRs? Okay, that's, um, there's a, there are a fair few points in there. I think that in terms of just the, the simple overexpression question, the, the good thing about these um, time-resolved FRET systems is that um, it's a very specific effect. So we're only looking at binding activity to a, a tagged receptor. Now, if you have a lot of other receptor in there, it could complicate issues in terms of potentially depleting high affinity traces. So if you get a lot of binding to, to endogenous ligands, you may reduce the overall concentration of ligand available to bind your tag light receptors. But also, I suppose, if you were thinking about uh, what we spoke about before with, with agonist binding and maybe a dependency on effector proteins, then I'm, I'm sure, of course, that if you have two receptors competing for the same effector, you, you may have a competition issue there. I, I think we, I, we simply don't know enough. I think the only real uh, way we've looked at this at the moment is looking at G-protein dependent high affinity binding with, with agonists that I described earlier. Although there are now examples of arrest independent stabilization of particular receptor states as well. Um, these are all very good questions that I just don't think are, are well understood in the field yet. And I think that there are other systems, there are people using BRET systems where they're using, rather than uh, these two fluorescent ligands, they're, they're using um, luciferase to measure out and looking at receptor and effector coupling as well. So those systems in combination perhaps with these um, fret binding assay, we might get closer to that, but I, I don't think there's one straightforward answer for that question at the moment. Okay. All right. Look, Stephen, uh, Louise, Kath, thank you for those answers. Um, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we are about to run out of time. Thank you very much, and goodbye.